everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. This one's short, uh, and it's really mostly in response to some comments that came up from yesterday's video. So this is not my weekly video, but I want to talk about how on earth, and why on earth, do raptor hybrids occur in the wild? It seems very counterintuitive. Nature will uh, streamline a species to be perfect for what it is and what it does. And those boundaries normally don't cross. And in fact, there's usually, if you're closely related enough that you could interbreed, usually there's competition. Either like, get out of my territory, you're not my same species or my mate, or even worse, Get out of my territory, I'm a little bigger than you. Like Gosshawk going after Cooper's Hawk, Cooper's Hawk going after a sharp Hawk. So it's unexpected. It most definitely does happen. And there's a number of reasons. Some of them are, are pretty classic standard reasons, and some of them are wackadoodle reasons. Uh, but the first example I kind of want to give, I'm, again, I want to talk specifically about Gosshawks and Cooper's Hawks because they have kind of some odd reasons. But the first major reason that raptors hybridize is something we call extinction blah, 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 extinction insurance, right? So you don't want to go extinct, and therefore it's a form of extinction insurance. And the most classic, classic example we talk about in the United States of that is the peregrine falcon prairie falcon hybrid. It's extremely rare now, but you go back a few decades and it was actually quite common. And the reason for this, peregrine falcons, uh, the prey they hunt was uh, filled with, poisoned by the uh, insecticide pesticide DDT. And it was going through the system, right? It gets sprayed on crops. Little bugs eat it and die. And then little birds eat the little bugs. And then the peregrine falcon eats the little bird. And the levels of DDT going up the food chain were bigger and bigger and bigger. By the time it got to a peregrine falcon, they some of them would die from it themselves. But more importantly, it made their eggshells thinner. So when the moms would sit on it, the eggshells would not hatch. Or it would even kill the babies inside. So you had multiple generations with not uh, many eggs hatching. So the number of wild peregrines were quite rare. Now, prairie falcons are incredibly closely related to the peregrine falcon, but they kind of are, are they're, they're, they're usually further away from water. They're more of a desert bird. Uh, they typically nest in extremely desolate areas. And even though they can hunt some of the same prey, they typically don't. And so because they're more isolated away from farms, they were away from that pesticide. So their numbers were pretty high still. They weren't impacted that much by the pesticide DDT. And as such, you would have these peregrines that had no mate and they couldn't find a mate. And as such, the closest thing was a prairie falcon. So as a, uh, an act of extinction insurance, they would uh, uh, interbreed with prairie falcons. Uh, the U.S. government did not like this because work was being done to try to save the peregrine falcon, and this was viewed as a, as a dilution of the species and of their DNA, which I guess technically is, but this is a human-made problem. Nature comes up with their own solution to handle it, and humans are like, no! So you had instances where iries, where a peregrine and a prairie were paired up. The government would blast it and to to stop the birds. Sometimes the young were killed by the government, and then sometimes they would take the young and then give them to a zoo and be like, hey, we just don't want these breeding in the wild. Uh, so you had a wide range. In a few instances, they were even given to falconers, is what I'm told. So there was a wide range of what was happening, but it was like, ah, we can't do this. But the point I'm bringing up is it was extinction insurance. And again, now that peregrine numbers, peregrine falcons have been off the endangered species list here in the U.S. since 1999, August of 99. They're doing great. I see them constantly. I see them more frequently than prairie falcons. And we don't see hybridizing going on very often anymore. However, it's kind of interesting. Um, even if they do, then that offspring, that hybrid, is going to work its way back into the gene pool of one side or the other and quickly be almost indistinguishable. So it's maybe half peregrine, half prairie. Next generation, it's three quarters peregrine and one, one quarter prairie, and then so on and so on to where it's unrecognizable. That's how it usually goes, and it doesn't impact the system really. Now, the interesting thing, I help volunteer for wildlife rehabilitation group here in Utah, and a lot of their interesting birds come in, they get constant birds, and sometimes they'll, they'll be like, hey, what do you think about this falcon or this hawk? This looks a little weird. We've had uh, there at the rehab center, uh, rough-legged hawk, red-tailed hawk hybrids come in where you're like, that looks like a red-tailed hawk, but it's booted. And, ah, oh, wait a minute. And you look at the head structure, feather structure, and that ah, turns out to be a hybrid. Uh, on two occasions, we've had peregrine prairie hybrids come in that were 
almost looked like a pure peregrine, but there are a couple of things in, that it's like, nah, that looks prairie. And it's like, yeah, there's a little bit of prairie falcon in that. So it does happen. It does happen with a lot of different birds, but it's kind of rare. But usually extinction insurance is the reason for that. Now, in the case of goshawks and cooper's hawks, which is the whole point of this video, that is the usual reason too. Almost all of the wild pair, uh, sorry, goshawk, cooper's hawk hybrids that have been found usually by bird banders, right, biologists, have been back east, which you got to think where goshawks are not supposed to exist in some of those areas. So if you have a goshawk wander around, because pushing your range boundaries of your species is also extinction insurance, but if you're in new territory and you're like, I'm not finding a mate, then a cooper's hawk is the closest bird and so it can happen uh, for that very same reason but there's another strange reason that uh, could also potentially be uh, a reason why and that is the fact that cooper's hawks will mate when they are still in juvenile plumage first year plumage now all of our north american occipiters goshawks cooper's hawks sharp -shin hawks all three of them they have uh, basically the same markings in their first year right there they're kind of creamish tan with brown streaks and, and, and brown on the back uh, before they get their adult colors. Now, they have that their whole first year of life, and then once they're one year old, they molt in and get their adult colors and will re-get the adult colors every year after. Well, in the case of Cooper's Hawks, uh, it's sort of the whole uh, live fast, die young attitude. Cooper's Hawks have a very high mortality rate in the wild, uh, not only for first year birds, but for all of them hit by cars, killed by a larger predator, run into a window while they're chasing songbirds at a bird feeder and break their neck. Lots of things like that happen. And so as such, uh, one of the uh, Cooper's, one of the um, techniques that Cooper's hawks employ to keep their numbers high is to start breeding earlier on, right? So think about a goshawk. A goshawk in its first year colors, it's like, oh, okay, you, you look like this. Then it's one year old, it, it gets its adult colors. And then maybe it's second year, third year, it's gotten it's gotten more experience. Its eyes turn deeper and deeper red, uh, showing to a potential mate, hey, I'm experienced, I've lived this long, I can be a good provider. And then uh, sets up its own territory, tries to find a mate. It's normal that that process might take a few years, two, three, four, five years. Well, in the case of Cooper's Hawks, there's more on the line, and there's a good chance they might not make it uh, very many years of life. And so what'll happen is a lot of Cooper's Hawks will breed and raise a family with first year plumage, which means they are a year old. However, they are trying to, they, 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 they're just starting to get their adult colors and they find a mate. It's very frequent where you will even have both the male and the female Cooper's Hawk, even though they're a year old, they still have their first year colors. And, or one is a, has adult colors, one does not. I've seen many nests this way, highly unusual. You don't see that often in the raptor world at all. But Cooper's Hawks, it is incredibly common. With that in mind, if you are a goshawk, in addition to extinction insurance, a Cooper's hawk in first year plumage looks an awful lot like a small goshawk that it, that in first year plumage. So that has been hypothesized as one of the reasons why. If you have a goshawk that has been unable to find a mate and it finds a Cooper's hawk in first year plumage that is receptive to calls, food trades, and certain displays that say, hey, would, would, you know, would you like to pair off and, and be a mated pair? Then that could be the reason why, because it's kind of like, well, you look even more like my species than if you were actually an adult. Now, the third reason, well, the third reason, of course, there's all kinds of weird exceptions to the rules, but I want to bring up a specific one. Uh, the Snyders are a famous couple who uh, would go around and uh, do biological surveys, photograph, um, photograph uh, birds at their nests. They'd set up a blind and pick a season and pick a species. They're like, we're going to stay here and basically live in this blind and photograph and film and document this. They are very good at what they do. Uh, it is, and I will also note, they have been incredibly outspoken and vocal against falconry. And I find that interesting. In their book that uh, we're looking at here, they did something very interesting on their chapter about goshawks. They searched and searched and found a goshawk nest and built a tree stand far enough away and 
goshawks are notoriously skittish, so it's like, okay, we have to be extra careful not to disturb them. Well, uh, they got things set up, left, and came back at the right time of year, and it turns out the eggs failed. The eggs had not hatched. They were there, but they hadn't hatched, and they thought, oh no, we've spent all this time to find this nest. This season is shot. And so they did something interesting, was effective for them, but highly illegal, and I think could have potentially be another answer to the whole point of this video. What they did is they knew where a Cooper's Hawk nest was, and so they were like, oh, okay, and they just got a baby Cooper's Hawk out of that nest that was still a fluffy downy chick, and just broop, brought it to the goshawk nest, climbed up, put it in the goshawk nest, and the goshawks are like, oh, one of our eggs hatched. Well, we'll raise it. And so they raised that bird up, and of course, as it grew older and older, those first year colors looked like a, just a really small goshawk to them. And then eventually, it successfully fledged and left, and the parents left. Well, that Cooper's hawk is now imprinted on goshawks. It thinks it's a goshawk. Both of its parents were goshawks, which means once it reached breeding adulthood, in Lewis looking for a mate, that Cooper's hawk would most certainly be out there looking for a goshawk to start a family with. Uh, and so things like that could potentially have ramifications. A little tiny thing like that, a little illegal in, uh, discrepancy committed could have big impacts. And other instances like that potentially could have happened as well. Well-meaning people being like, well, hey... I've got a goshawk that we was orphaned. Hey, we're going to put it in a Cooper's hawk nest. They're close enough. It'll raise it. Who knows? So little things like that could also be the cause of it. But again, in general with raptors, normally the primary thing we see is extinction insurance. If you are looking for your same species to start a family with, you are having no luck repeatedly, and there is a, another species in your area that is very closely related, that is the most common thing that happens and the most common reason why it happens. And again, you could say, well, that's terrible, but at the same time, that's nature. That's what nature does, and it's nature's way to handle that problem. So interesting point. I hope you found this video interesting. Uh, let me know your thoughts, your experiences, the things you have seen on this topic. And as always, happy hawking.